Hey, Rector. As you make your way into Rector's machine shop, you find him staring up at the display mounted over his workbench. The screen is cramped to overflowing with blueprints, schematics, and technical readouts. After a long pause, he turns away from the display and faces you, a satisfied expression on his face. Ah yes, hello again my friend. Is there something that I can do for you? Did I catch you in the middle of something? Nothing that I cannot step away from. I was just doing a little design work, toying with a few novel concepts. He runs a hand through his hair. I've always found immersing myself in productive work to be the best cure for a restless mind. That's true. Yes, that's true. Better to, like, make something than to break stuff. <laughs> like, productive work is better than destructive work. But tell me, my friend, what brings you down to my shop? Um, what did you think of the last run? A fascinating job, and one that I was happy to take part in. The experiments that Shiawase were conducting in that lab were all quite intriguing. From the work that they were doing on SARS-3 to the sleeper agents that they were creating via the Silver Dream project. It was all good science, ethical concerns notwithstanding. <laughs> good, good science? Um, I'm not sure this... <laughs> I don't think it was good science, Rector. Like... The sleeper agents weren't very good. Most of them failed. And the and the virus, like the virus just, just kills everybody in the world. Like what what what's the use of creating that? I am thankful to you that you allowed Janet Sang to live. It would have been within your rights to kill her, of course. She obstructed us at, at every turn, and we have put others to the sword for much less. All that being said, she remains a brilliant scientist and a contributor to the advancement of human knowledge. I do take I take comfort in knowing that she will continue to do so. <laughs> well, hold up. SARS-3 and Silver Dream are the kinds of advancements that our species would be better off without. I mean... <laughs> Look, y yes, but here's the thing. The kind of, like, medical technology required to create SARS-3 is the same kind of medical technology required to create, like, cures for diseases, right? So the technology itself is not evil. It's just how you apply the technology that's evil. Like, for example, like, creating a, a, a biological weapon. You can use it to create biological cures to a lot of diseases. Like, it's the same technology. And the Silver Dream stuff, like, yes, using them to create sleeper agents to murder people is probably not the best way to do that. But you know, there's, maybe there's also for like neurological therapies that you can, you can use the technology for. Right, the, the underlying technology can be used for good. Anyway, I want to see what he says about it. No, my friend, I cannot agree with such an assertion. Ignorance is never preferable to knowledge. It may be easier in some cases, but that doesn't make it better. No, I didn't say ignorance is better. I'm saying like actually creating a deadly virus is, is not good. <laughs> Who knows what other breakthroughs the development of SARS-3 might lead to? What secrets of human consciousness the Silver Dream Project may have laid bare? And how can you assign a value to all of the future good that might flow from those cascading discoveries? Yeah, that's basically what I said. Like, the technology developed to make those things can be used for good. Nevertheless, you probably shouldn't en enslave people, and you probably shouldn't make weapons of mass destruction. Like, having the ability to make weapons of mass destruction is not the same thing as actually making it, and then storing it, and then having me steal it. <laughs> and, like, having a weapon of mass destruction in a lab that I then broke into and stole from, that's not a good idea. <laughs> right? Like, you know, like, like a real-world a real world example. Like, Japan, for example, has the technology to create nuclear weapons, but they don't have nuclear weapons. Because they don't have no intention of using nuclear weapons, right? Because, like, you know, they've made the decision that, no, we don't want to make this weapon, because, like, killing millions of people is not, is not something we're ever going to do. So, but it doesn't mean they don't know how to do it. They, can, they know how to do it, <laughs> right? It's, it's, but they choose not to do it. So it's not about ignorance, it's about choosing not to do a thing that's clearly dangerous and bad. Yes, Silver Dream and SARS-3 are both harmful applications of Shiawase's research, and the proliferation of either would have 
with disastrous human consequences. On this we are agreed, but I cannot condemn the science behind them. <laughs> it's the... <laughs> I mean... I'd like... Like, Rector, Rector can partition these things, and so can I, actually. Like I, like, I can also separate the technology from the application. But I... But I don't think Shiawase can. You see what I mean? <laughs> the actual scientist and the actual corporation doing the work, they're not separating the science from the application. They're just making things that are highly dangerous. So like, Rector can can like figure this out and I can figure this out, but I don't think Shiawase figured it out. And I think they were just being reckless. Now, do you have any other questions or should I return to my work? What do you intend to do after we finish this? Have you been doing any more design work on cost chain recently? As a matter of fact, I have. Nothing bad I'll be fabricating anytime soon, mind you. But I've been exploring a recent obsession, trying to hammer it into something useful. His lips curl into a rueful smile. The concept is somewhat, how to put it, avant-garde, perhaps. But with time, I hope to put it to the test. Tell me more about this avant-garde concept of yours. Perhaps it will be best if I show it to you. In just a moment, I'll clear away the clutter so that you can see for yourself. He turns to his terminal and rattles off a series of commands, and the windows that crowd the display disappear. You're left with a perspective view of something that looks like a cross between a scorpion's leg and the jawbone of a large carnivore. The entire assembly bristles with jagged tooth-like protrusions. Uh-huh. Our encounter with the Yama King was a revelatory, re revelatory experience for me. To see such a being up close, to watch how it moved with my own eyes, to observe the crenellations of its flesh and the sculpted ivory of its crown, he spread his hands. I was, for lack of a better word, inspired. <laughs> Are you gonna give Koschei a thousand teeth? <laughs> Suppose I can't blame you. Tianya inspired a lot of people. <laughs> You're speaking of the nightmares, of course. <laughs> he taps a fresh cigarette out of the pack in his pocket, lights it, and hangs it from his lower lip. I suspect that the queen with a thousand teeth left an indelible mark on us all. Honestly, though, like I thought it was a really cool design. Right, I th I thought I thought the queen, the queen with a thousand teeth was a great design. Like this, like this huge thing, six arms, eight arms, six arms. Was it six arms? It's eight arms. A lot of arms, many more teeth. He turns back to his terminal and stabs a key with a finger. The window containing the model leg disappears. At any rate, I'm still a long way off from fabricating anything usable. Emulating the physiology of a creature that should not exist is proving to be quite the design challenge. Yeah, I don't know it's, if it's physically possible. It is, however, a wonderful way to kill time between jobs, and who knows, against all odds, this work might one day bear fruit. Only time will tell. Ah, yes. A drone with a thousand teeth. <laughs> Do you think maybe, like, hit a bigger drone? Because she was massive. You can't fit all a thousand teeth on something this small. What do you intend to do after we finish this? He shrugs. I suppose that I'll return to what I was doing before. We got press ganged into working with the Hong Kong police force. I will shuttle run for funds and entertainment, and spend my spare hours working on and refining my mechanical counterpart. <laughs> Cost Chase scurries forward, and Rector rests his hands on the drone's chassis. The drone rubs up against his leg like a dog. Light glinting off of the smooth contours of its hardened body. Always a work in progress, don't you know? How could he not be? To improve Koschei is to improve the best part of myself. I don't think that I can agree with that. The best part of you is your mind. And Koschei is the ultimate expression of that mind. He is my masterpiece, the enduring work that I will leave behind. He smiles, his eyes twinkling. 
that's assuming that I failed to achieve immortality, of course. And that is far from a foregone conclusion, I assure you. <laughs> well, keep working on it, Rector. <laughs> keep working on it. And what about you, my friend? Do you have any grand ambitions to share? If so, share them. I am all ears. Uh, I can't say what my plans are for certain. We just have to see how this thing plays out. A fair answer. I suppose that we shall have to wait and see for ourselves. He gives his cigarette a tap, and the ash that clings to the tip spills to the floor. Let us change the subject, eh? The future can wait. I'm sure that there are many more pressing matters that we could discuss. Alright, gotta run later. Kaichu! Hello again. Is there anything else I can assist you with? What do you think of the last run? I have never been in an underwater secret laboratory before. That was novel, I must confess. Kaichu shrugs. Beyond that, it was a job. I'm unsure what more to say about that. Hey, guys, you, do you think you would die to SARS-3, or would your um, good nature protect you from the virus? I'm unconcerned by the morality, or lack thereof, involved in the creation of weaponized plagues. Their creation is dangerous, short-sighted, and not worth the trouble. But every mega-corporation does such things. <laughs> yeah, why is that, guys, you? If it really is short-sighted, not worth the trouble, why do they all do it? <laughs> Shiawase is hardly alone in this, or in having a manager so foolish as to use one to obtain a favorable quarterly review. <laughs> it could have been a lot worse, you know. <laughs> Believe me, I am aware. We could have become infected, or SARS-3 could have spread far beyond the client, or we could have contracted some other engineered pathogen. I doubt that SARS-3 was the only one in the lab. I am pleased with the outcome. <laughs> Still, we were paid, we survived, and nothing worse happened. I would count that as a success. Sure it is, Kaiju. Alright, talk to you later. <laughs> Could be worse. Alright, Kaiju, thank you. Thank you for that nugget of wisdom. <laughs> Could always be worse. <laughs> Hey, Duncan, do you want SARS? Uh... Hey, Duncan, have you noticed all the bird crap in the big taxes? What gives? Dunno, I haven't seen any. His lips part and he snaps his fingers. Actually, hey, now that you mention it, I might have heard a bird. He nods thoughtfully. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I thought that maybe it was just a rat scratching around inside the walls, but it didn't really sound like one. Little fucker kept me up a couple of nights ago. <laughs> Uh, I'm surprised that I haven't heard or seen it. Well, for all we know, it might n not be a bird. Oh, what are you saying? A bird is the easy answer, but we're ruling out some other important possibilities. It could be another squatter, or a late night scavenger, or maybe something's loose inside the rotting walls. Inside these rotting walls. Hell, maybe it's a possum. We're only assuming that it's a bird because of all the shit everywhere. Occam's razor, Duncan. The simplest answer is usually correct. An annoyed Duncan leans his back against the cabin wall. Alright, let's say that it is a bird. I'll just lure it out somehow. Ah, uh, Knock yourself out. Or the bird, preferably. I think we already established that it likes rappers. Have we? How? How do we establish that? Knock yourself out. Or the bird, preferably. With a roll of his broad shoulders, he shrugs off your comment. I've got it, Simon. But I've got a feeling that this whole thing is going to wind up being a real pain. He looks around and shakes his head. Jesus, this place. Can't wait to get out of here. Well, maybe you should just, just get out of here. Alright, gotta run later. Duncan. Easily abused. Oh, Isabel. Stale, metallic air fills Isobel's cabin. The round window that's usually cracked is shut tight, and it feels like the temperature in the room has raised somewhat. Maybe due to the lack of ventilation. Isobel is on her knees, hunched over her cyberdeck, typing vigorously. 
You can see sweat beating on her forehead. She looks exhausted. Exhausted. She pauses and sits up for a moment. 4.19 a.m. 1 nano drive. You okay there, Isabel? Isabel turns towards you. A pair of tired eyes meets your gaze. Her shoulders look stiff as if she's been hunched over for a while, and a single red cable protrudes from the dark mass of her hair. She repeats herself. One nano drive. She leans back down and continues to clack away on the deck. 4.48 a.m. One splitter. 4.33 a.m. Small double-ended cable bundle. Her voice suddenly turns angry as her fingers jam the keyboard. And my favorite hairband! <laughs> she suddenly lurches upright and looks at you, her brow furrowed, and proceeds to stare in silence. Uh, what's this about a hairband? Her lips pucker as she studies your face. The damn bird! It took my favorite hairband. Oh. I've... This... I've never seen this frazzle before. It's a little upsetting. The decker moans, clearly irritated. She closes her eyes and rubs her temples. For a few weeks now, things... A few weeks? We've only been here for like a day. My things have been disappearing. I didn't notice it at first because it was just small objects, mostly food wrappers. But once my hairband went missing, I started looking around and realized that quite a few of my smaller possessions were gone. I've never seen you wear a hairband. She shoots you a sassy, narrow-eyed look you wouldn't have because it's missing! And last night I finally saw the culprit, a damned boo-boo. I was jacked into the Matrix doing some route routine tasks. Then something came through my window. I watched it land on the wooden floor and hop around like it was searching for someone. Her eyes go wide as she and she stares ahead. It was the boo boo and it was looking for me. But I was in the matrix. My body was right there. She pats the floor near her computer. The stupid thing stared at me until it knew I wasn't awake. Then rifled through my stuff and started carrying things away. She motions to her cyber deck. It came back four times in two hours. I'm accessing my matrix logs here to confirm the times. Shit, I need that splitter too. Uh huh, what are you gonna do about it? I need to figure out where the boo boo's stashing what it's stealing. I need to get my things back. If anyone with any kind of technical savvy finds them before I do, I have no doubt they'll end up on the black market. Stupid bird doesn't know that it's sitting on a fortune in custom parts. A fortune. Isabel wearily, wearily runs a hand through her hair. Her fingers stumble upon the red cable and she plucks it out with a look of mouth disgust as she sighs. Alright, I've got to crack down on this SEKC, so if you need something from me, tell me what it is now. Uh, what did you think of the last run? Well, it was scenic. <laughs> uh, was it really that bad? She exhales through her nose. No, it wasn't. I think I'm just still processing what happened. Between you and me, those people, the prisoners, they got to me. I can't imagine what it'd be like to sense their auras and feel their pain, but I'm sure it have been deeply disturbing experience. The whole thing's left me kind of unnerved. I rely so heavily on my tech to see it used that way, and to know that the Matrix tech that I use every day might have gone through human trials in a lab just like that one. She raises her hand, palm out, and closes her eyes. I can't talk about it anymore, I'm sorry, can we change the subject? Alright, bye. Hey, Garbit. So, uh, about your noodle machine, it's warm to the touch. Have you... have you made any noodles? Goblet raises an eyebrow. Another day in paradise, eh Seattle? Seriously though, we should get on that run for Chew and Lamb. The sooner we hit that police station, the sooner we can watch Crate's messy public downfall. I'm not usually usually one for spectator sports, but this one... This, this is one that I want a, a front row seat for. Don't worry Goblet, we'll hit the station soon enough. Good, so what's up with you? After we kill Crate, what's next for you? Got any big plans? She shrugs. Not really. I'm happy where I'm at. 
Even Auntie Chang has gotten nicer since the whole Ward City thing. What about you? Are you thinking of doing something different after all this is over? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. I haven't put a whole lot of thought into it. Yeah, well, don't think too hard. Things would get boring around here if you took off. I wouldn't... I don't do well with boredom. Cause even if you were to scurry off somewhere, I'd keep tabs on you. That's what friends do. I'd prefer it if you stayed though. You're the only person on this boat who's brave enough to eat my cooking. <laughs> Alright, gotta run. Can I get noodles? No? Alright, no noodles. I don't want to talk to the cops, do I? Constable Hui? Hui stands off to the side, his eyes fixed on the PDA in his hands, he doesn't seem to notice you. You see his mouth part and the muscles in his neck tense as he takes a deep breath and slowly releases it. Runner, what's it this time? Uh, how'd you know that it was me? He motions to your feet, eyes still on the PDA, your footsteps. You can tell a lot about a person by the sound of their footfall, their weight, their height, if they're carrying something heavy, if they're struggling to stay upright, if they've got cybered limbs, if they're angry, scared or happy, the sound of your feet reveals a lot. I simply took note of your stride when we first met, now I always know when you're coming. He shrugs, then switches his PDA's display screen off, he looks at you. Just a little something I picked up on the streets, but I'm sure you're here with other business, name it. Nope. Gotta go. Ah, <laughs> uh, I mean, they have something to say. I don't have anything to say to, to, say to them, though. Alright, one more mission, and then we get a minigun. Alright, I'm gonna save the game here, take a break. When we come back, we uh, help Jomo's friend do something. I forgot what it was. Alright, see you next time.